Today is Wednesday, October 27th, and at this time about a third of the class has taken the test. Uh, preliminary scores are looking well, so again, I have every confidence that uh, the rest of the class is going to do well. Um, minor things to be aware of in terms of this, the calendar. We have two more testing groups this week, or this afternoon and Friday afternoon. Uh, so. Most everyone, if you haven't taken the test already, and unless you have talked to me specifically about why you can't do it this week, you should be signed up for either Wednesday or Friday and should come to those unless some other circumstance comes up, in which case, please tell me immediately. Um, I have also already posted the chapter six homework and quiz, uh, just so that they are up for people who are done with the test to have something to work on. So if you have completed the test or when you complete the test, I do recommend you begin looking at those, at least a little hands at the homework. Um, and tentatively, I have set its earliest due date as of November 8th, so that we have all of this in next week to talk about it, and then you have that Monday to ask questions. Um, so I am planning on talking about chapter six this week, the days where students don't have specific test related questions, plus it. Um, and since we're starting on it, homework is up. I do recommend starting it as once you're done with the test. Don't worry about it until the test is until you're done with the test. Uh, tests, I, sh I am hoping, my goal is to have them back and graded, graded and back to you at some point next week. I wouldn't expect it on Monday itself, but my goal is to have them ready during the week. Uh, next week is set to be a normal week for us. Lecture all three days in the normal lab. Come to lab as normal. And we're set schedules to continue moving forward about a chapter a week until Thanksgiving. Uh, those remaining chapters of this semester, the, the main focus of this particular class, 1500 as opposed to like 1510, is primarily motion and mechanics of physical objects in three-dimensional space. We've primarily been looking at rather straightforward linear forces and linear movement, and that is set to continue for this week. This week we're going to, this and next week we're going to talk about, about momentum and collisions, primarily in one dimension, and um, that'll be a nice sort of jumping off point for the rest of the class. But as these coming weeks in November go on, we're going to start talking about less linear ca uh, topics, such as objects that are rotating or are turning in two-dimensional or three-dimensional space, and eventually um, talk about pressure, which is its own category of thing. Right now, though, if you haven't taken the test yet, please focus exclusively on the stuff from this first test. Once you're done with the test, please look at the momentum also. Um, my plan for today, for most of the lecture, if no one has any test-related questions, is to begin talking about Chapter 6, or rather, continue talking about Chapter 6. We've technically already started it because we have begun discussing momentum. And I think that's most of the main announcements for now. 
How do you guys feel when you have any questions? Yes. So, I know like during some of the homework, there were some types of problems that aren't on the practice sheet for the practice problems. Will there mm -hmm. still be a possibility that those types of questions are on the test? Or no. I made the test myself after you know, all the homeworks we did. I tried to think about what questions I think work well, the best questions that encapsulate the concepts that can be done within the time frame of a one hour test. Because some of the homework questions just take time to brute force through, which is not ideal for a one hour test scenario. So I've tried to take, I think, the best, the best representative types of questions and write them in a way that makes them manageable within the time allotted. The practice guide was made up of a cluster of those, and the test is the final refined version. So I wrote it myself. It's not web assigned, it's me based on how the classes are going. And my body cannot decide on what temperature I'm supposed to be at this morning. Welcome to winter in the south. Any, any other questions at all about anything? Even random stuff. Any test concepts you guys would like to discuss today? Or questions from past things or the study guide? And it is okay if you ask in the middle of lecture. I encourage you to interrupt me. Alright, well, like I said, do please interrupt me as uh, the class goes on. For any questions at all, you can also email me anytime. For now then, we will continue examining chapter 6. If my computer will catch up to what I want it to. There you go. So, uh, the big content flag here is this is primarily stuff well this is us beginning to move past test one material so if you haven't taken it yet and as you're writing this down if you haven't taken the test yet do not study this for the test that's entirely stuff before this stuff on the practice sheet and on the topic on the topic list it's new material that is not going to be representative of the stuff on the test there is a momentum question on the test, but we're now moving into other applications of momentum. Any concerns, any questions about that? Okay, so, chapter six is largely the momentum chapter. We have already defined momentum, but let's revisit that definition briefly. Momentum is very similar to concepts that we have already discussed. And as with most of these concepts, it is something you have already interacted with in your life. I guarantee that for certain. Even if you haven't used the exact word to refer to the exact phenomenon. The definition of momentum is a quantity related to the motion of an object with matter, uh, which means that only objects made of matter can have momentum. Uh, an object needs to have both mass and velocity in order to have momentum. Which says a few things off the bat. One, if an object isn't moving, then it has no momentum. Two, if something doesn't have mass but is moving, it still doesn't technically have momentum. And really the only thing that refers to is light. So, light is weird, it moves but it doesn't have momentum. We'll leave other scientists to discuss that one. Um, now, based on this definition, momentum is very similar to two other things we have already talked about. We've already compared it to kinetic energy. The formula for momentum is mass times velocity. So again, you have to have mass and you have to be moving in order to have momentum. And the formula for kinetic energy very similar, one half times mass times velocity squared. They contain the same variables, and whenever an object has one, it will also have the other. 
there is no way to get a non-zero momentum and at the same time have no kinetic energy. Because you plug in the same numbers, and if you don't get zero out of one, you won't get zero out of the other. So they do go hand in hand, and they do both have the effect of causing objects to move and remain moving. But the, simil the uh, differences between them do start piling up over time. Primary difference is simply that momentum is a vector, whereas kinetic energy is not a vector. No form of energy is a vector. It can't be, because uh, you, you, know, you can't have energy pointing in a direction. The formula has a vector in it, the velocity, but when we square that velocity, we multiply a vector by a vector, that, in, that tends to sort of cancel out the vector direction involved, and so that ends up with just scalar, non-directional kinetic energy. Momentum, though, there's no square. It's just a scalar times a vector, so momentum itself comes out as a vector. Momentum points in the same direction as the velocity of the object. Momentum is what is specifically compelling that object to keep moving at this velocity in that direction. Kinetic energy doesn't care how you're moving, it just cares that you're moving. Momentum specifically wants you to move in the same direction for as long as possible. Bless you. Another similarity between these two things is when they are when objects ha that have kinetic energy and momentum are involved in collisions, then kinetic energy can transfer from one object to another, and momentum can transfer from one object to another. So it does behave similarly to energy in that it can transfer between objects, but it will still point in the same direction even when it does that. Kinetic energy has no direction, so it doesn't care what direction everything moves after the collision, but the momentum does. I think it is worth defining the term collision uh, based on that, because we are going to start looking at more situations that can be classified as collisions. The definition we are going to use uh, a collision is an interaction where two or more objects with mass make contact and exchange energy and momentum. And this definition can cause a lot of different things to technically be collisions. And we are going to do the same type of math for all of them, even if it doesn't look like two objects physically you know, hit each other and collide. Lots of situations are going to categorize under this basic definition of math. Questions so far? So, let us look at a few different cases. We have four different situations here, each containing a different mass and a different velocity. Real quick, I'd like you guys to just work amongst yourselves. Tell me which of these four situations has the most momentum in it.
We have one vote for part two. Any other picks for the most momentum? Silently, if you'd like. One vote for three. We've got a couple nods, so that's at least two people that agree with three. I think I saw one motion for C, one more nod. We're up to at least four, maybe five votes for C. And the winner is C. Why is A, by default, not the most momentum? No velocity. It's not moving. Multiply zero by anything. So it's definitely not A. B is not a bad guess, but as is frustratingly often the case, our formula is designed to take kilograms, not grams. So if you multiplied 10 by 1,000, that would be the biggest number up here, but you technically need to multiply 0 0.01 by 1,000, and that comes out to 10 units of momentum. We'll skip the D real quick. This, is a, this car has a lot of mass, but it's driving very slowly. And this one centimeter does need to be converted to meters. And that would be 0 0.01 meters per second, which I think comes out to 20 units. That leaves the dog. Its mass and its velocity are already in the correct units. Multiply those, you get 250, and that does turn out to be the winner. I would like to use these numbers as sort of a sense of scale to point out that momentum can colloquially be thought of as how hard it is to stop a specific object in motion. The more momentum something has, the more effort it's going to take to actually slow it down and bring it to a complete stop. The less momentum something has, the easier it is to make it stop. The easiest thing to make stop is something that's already stopped. It takes no effort, it's already there. You do nothing. Um, let's look at the car. It is a very heavy car, very large mass, but it is moving very slowly. That speed, 0.01 meters per second, is so slow you probably wouldn't even notice. It's probably even slower than idle speed. And you could stop it probably simply by just putting your foot against the bumper and staying still. That would be all it would take. Um, similarly but differently, bullet has almost no mass, and so even though it's moving quickly, it doesn't take technically take very much to stop. It'll stop pretty much as soon as it hits anything. It'll be deflected by a piece of metal a simple thin piece of metal too. Whereas technically and kind of weirdly, the dog would take the most effort for a human to go over and grab and hold in place. Mathematically at least, not necessarily factoring in the issues for the issues brought in by the surface area of the bullet. So momentum can be thought of as how hard it is to make an object stop. This, questions so far? All right. This thought pattern of momentum as how hard it is to stop a moving object draws a comparison between momentum and another concept, not just kinetic energy, but also inertia. We talked about inertia. Inertia is Newton's first law. An object in motion tends to remain in motion, and an object at rest will remain at rest until outside forces act upon it. Both inertia and momentum compel objects to keep moving as they are moving in the same direction at the same velocity for as long as possible. The difference is
Most scientists tend to regard the measure of inertia as mass itself. If you measure the mass of an object, that is automatically the inertia of an object, which means that objects that are stationary still have inertia compelling them to remain stationary. Meanwhile, stationary objects have zero momentum. Inertia is what keeps objects still. Momentum has nothing to do with stationariness. Whereas both factor into an object that is currently in motion. But what's interesting is kinetic energy and inertia don't really care what direction you're moving in. Only momentum does. And so momentum, with its vector arrow, is the reason why when objects are involved in collisions, those objects try to keep moving in the same direction throughout and after the collision to the best of their ability. Momentum is a vector, and it's going to become very important when doing math involving it. Speaking of that math, I'd like to briefly point out the unit of momentum. Unlike force and energy that have their own dedicated unit, we don't for momentum. Instead, its unit is just derived of the two units that form it. Multiply mass times velocity, so the unit is kilograms times meters per second. Which is not fun to say, but there's literally nothing else to call it. And there's probably some scholarly debate as to why we use this as a unit and why we use lowercase rho as the variable for momentum. We definitely ran out of Latin and even, uh, we ran out of good Latin letters for things a long time ago. You'd think M would be used, but lowercase m is used for mass, and sometimes uppercase m is used for mass too. So the Latin alphabet doesn't have anything for us there. As for why we picked rho, which, if you haven't seen that spelled in English, the Greek letter rho is spelled as R-H-O in English. Capital rho is the big Greek P. Lowercase rho is the little Greek P, I think. I'm not a Greek scholar. And there's jokes as to why we did these things. I believe that most of the like math that Westerners still use for momentum was based on Newton's work. So we credit this to Newton, but since we already named the force unit after him, we didn't really have the name Newton left to use for this unit too. I suppose we could have called it Isaacs, but apparently we opted not to do that. Additionally, there's a lot of weird stories as to why this is the unit. Um, you could just call it rho momentum if you wanted to. But there's a weird tale about how Newton was uh, trying to talk about his current work at a, basically a cocktail party. And he was trying to describe momentum, but he hadn't named it yet. So he fished the olive out of his cocktail and was describing momentum in terms of the olive and the pimento inside of it. So the joke goes that he called it pimentum and that's why it uses this letter. I guarantee that story is fake, though, because I don't think Newton would ever go to a cocktail party. He was very much like Tesla in that regard. The man Tesla of the company. I've been rambling for a minute. Any questions from you guys? All right. Uh, in a minute, we will utilize this knowledge to examine a collision type question. Uh, first, we'll pause for a sec, because I need water. If you guys need water over the bathroom, now's a great time.
questions, needs, concerns, etc. All right. So, we have technically looked at situations that mathematically could be considered collisions in the past. Um, at the very least, similar situations where we have examined, say, the energy involved in an object or a series of objects before some change happens, and then compared that to the energy in those objects or in that system after some change has occurred, like comparing the before and after state of an object as it falls, or the before and after state of a compressed spring launching an object, and seeing how the energy changes between those two parts. Looking at the momentum in a collision, and also the energy in a collision, is very, very similar. In any type of collision, in any situation you could reasonably call a collision, there's always some before state and some after state. And the total momentum in every part of the initial state will always equal the total momentum after in the final state as well. Like energy, momentum can't be destroyed. It just has to go somewhere. And unlike energy, where energy can assume lots of different forms, momentum has only one form, momentum. So it's going to keep moving, and it's going to keep moving in the same direction until literally something else absorbs it and stops it. As a result, in all types of collisions, we will continue examining different types and form the differences between them, but a baseline for any type of collision, and this includes things that you wouldn't think count as collisions, total momentum initial equals total momentum final. It's true for any and all collisions. And therefore, as I recommend this, this statement, as your official starting point for any and all collision type questions. Because you know for certain that the momentum before will equal the momentum after. It'll swap what object has it. Velocities will change. Sometimes masses will change. But total momentum will remain constant. This is very similar to, whoops, a previous starting point that we used last chapter, where in cases where there is no friction, mechanical energy initial will equal mechanical energy final. Again, the energy and the momentum do behave similarly, so there's a reason that these look very similar. At the times, they behave very similarly in collisions. So we've done this type of math before. We've looked at these types of situations before. We're just doing it through the lens of momentum now. And so, let us use momentum to examine a specific situation. We're going to just have a nice little bit of target practice. We're going to shoot an arrow, a 10 gram arrow, at 25 meters per second, which is a pretty good launch speed, at a wooden log. I'm picturing this wooden log as sitting on a fence post some distance away and just taking shots at it to try to knock it down. We you know the mass of the log, and it is initially immobile, sitting still on the fence post. Now, before we examine the questions, before we do any math, real quickly, just, just based on your experience, based on your expectation, if you fire an arrow at a log on a fence post, what's going to happen after they collide? The arrow is probably going to embed itself in the log, and what's going to happen to the log? Someone might have said it, but my ears aren't good, and I can't see your lower jaw at the moment. Sorry. It's all over. It's 
probably going to fall over. It's just going to tip slowly off of the fence post with the arrow still in it. And we are going to prove that mathematically. One more quick question, though. Is the log going to fall off of the post at anywhere near the same speed the arrow was moving at? No. If a small, fast thing hits and sticks to a big, heavy thing, does the heavy thing tend to move at the same speed the fast thing approached it at? No. And the reason for that is the math that we're about to do. The log is about to absorb momentum from the arrow, but its larger mass will not move at the same speed with the same amount of momentum. Let's put numbers to that now. Uh, we're going to use this as our starting point. Total momentum initial equals total momentum final. Let's copy down the things we know and don't know. Mass of our arrow, we call that MA, is listed at 10 grams. Is that the number we want to use? Now, what are we going to convert that to? Sensor and MGG. Very good. That arrow's initial velocity, so I'm going to list that as velocity A initial, is 25 meters per second. Uh, we are also told the mass of the log, we'll call that ML at 5 kilograms, and its, its initial velocity, VLI, we're told it is stationary, so that's going to be 0 meters per second. It is not moving to start with. And the very first thing we're asked is, how much momentum is in the entire system, both log and arrow combined, before the collision occurs? So let's look at the before state. This is before they collide. This is our initial conditions. Total momentum initial, or total anything, you just want to add all of the relevant components together. So for total momentum initial, we want to look at and add together the initial arrow momentum plus the initial log momentum. We can expand those to become mass arrow times velocity arrow initial plus mass log times velocity log initial. Before we start plugging in numbers, does the log has any does the log have any initial momentum? No, the log isn't moving to start with. We'll prove that in a second. Any questions up till this point? Okay. Now we know all of these, so we can find a nice number here. Mass of arrow, we have converted to kilograms. So 0 0.01 times arrow's initial velocity of 25 plus mass log times log's initial velocity, which is zero, so that whole term will become zero. And so what does our total initial momentum become? for this would be kilograms times meters per second. Uh, the log has no initial momentum, but I like to show the full list of steps so that we can prove mathematically that it had none and get to the same total regardless. So initially, the arrow has all the momentum. It is what is bringing momentum into this collision. Questions approaching this answer. All right. 
next thing we're asked is how much momentum is in the same system after the collision occurs. So quick, just off the top of your head, knowing what we know about how momentum works, how much momentum is in the arrow and log together combined after the collision happens. 0.25, the same total will remain. The reason that I wrote this down the way that I did is so that I can still set that existing mass equal to total momentum final. So this was our initial total momentum and this will remain our final momentum total as well. So as long as we're only looking at these two objects, them combined will have the same amount. And so our last question is, assuming the arrow embeds itself in the log and they <coughs> together travel at the same final velocity, how fast will the arrow and log travel together after the collision? So now we're going to thoroughly examine the after side. We want to specifically know how fast they're going to move after they're stuck. So we've already filled in the initial half. Let's expand and fill in the final half. On the final side, you'll have momentum arrow final plus momentum log final. So the two objects, they each have their own final, final momentum that will be added together to form the total. We can expand that to be mass of arrow times velocity arrow final plus mass of log, forgot English for a second there, times velocity log final. So we built our equation. We already know what the left side equals, but can we currently solve the right side for either block? <coughs> the way that I have written it here, we're kind of stuck because there's two unknowns that are left, the AF and the LF. But the log and the arrow are stuck together they will have the same final velocity. So in this specific case, we can set the AF and the LF together as the same ultimate final velocity. They're stuck, they have to travel at the same speed. So there's not actually two variables here. Now, there's not two unknowns left. There's only one. This is the easy type of collision. Math tends to end up easier when objects either start together as one or end together as one. Because whichever version that is, they have to have the same velocity while they're stuck together, thus making only one variable instead of two. This specific situation is an inelastic collision because things don't bounce off of each other in this situation. They stick together and move as one, <coughs> as inelastic objects do in most inelastic collisions. Bless you. So this is, roughly speaking, the easiest type. Makes sense as a starting point. We will expand out from here the types of collisions and the complexity of collisions that we look at. Uh, for now, let's just finish this one to find that final velocity. Check the time. So since VF is the same for both, I've just turned them into one variable. Any questions leading up to this point? Okay. Um, so this is the same unknown for both of them. Uh, we do still know the masses, so we can plug those in. Actually, 
will give us on the right side 0 0.01 times VF plus 5 times VF. How do we get VF by, a, how do we fix the fact that there's currently two instances of VF? Sorry, the ladder. Factor it out. We can factor it out. We can employ the distributive property. We both have a VF, so we can just pull it out front. VF, therefore, will be equal to 0 0.01 plus 5. Any questions about that line of algebra? And just knowing that that's going to add up to 5.01, the last thing that we really need to do is simply divide this whole combined number over to the other side, and that will give us VF. VF is going to be really tiny, and that matches our expectation going into this. And what does that final number come out to be? Point zero 0.05. And since we solve for velocity, our final answer is going to be in meters per second. So, together, they travel very, very slow. And it's actually technically even slower than what's currently on the board, because I think the actual math comes out to 0 0.0499, maybe repeating a few times. It is, the log is moving, well, the log and arrow combined are moving much, much slower than the arrow initially was, because now this initial momentum is shared across a much larger combined mass. So this momentum, this small amount of momentum, can make a very small object move very quickly, but it will make a heavy object move very slowly. So the same amounts of momentum can look different depending on the mass of the object that possesses them. But another thing I want you to notice is all the velocities that we have plugged in and found are all pointing in the same direction. Velocity is a vector, sorry, velocity is a vector, momentum is a vector. So this 25 and this 0.05 are both pointing in the same direction. This will become in other more complicated collisions where things aren't always moving in the same direction, something might bounce off and fly backwards. But for right now, any questions about this scenario? Okay. That'll about wrap us up for today. Uh, in the near future, as we continue to look at momentum and collisions, we will look at progressively more complicated scenarios, including some things that you wouldn't think they're technically collisions, uh, an example of which, me throwing that marker is technically a collision. We'll do the math for that next time. Additionally, this is technically a collision. I don't have any audio, sorry. This truck is dropping a ball out of itself as it drives. Should that ball fall straight down or should it be rolling forwards? Straight down. If the truck simply dropped it, it should actually roll forwards. Because on the truck, it would have forward momentum, and that doesn't go away when it stops being part of the truck. What happens here is they actually shoot it out of a cannon at the end to give it backwards momentum in addition to its forward momentum. And as long as those two momentums were the same, they'll cancel out and the ball falls straight down as opposed to rolling forwards like most things that fall out of trucks. So there's some interesting cases ahead. And we will 
mathematically prove all of them and make them a lot more scary. So, if you have any questions about test stuff at all, please let me know. If you don't, please have a good time studying, have a nice day, and I'll see you soon.